Sure. Let's talk to God. Father, we want to thank you that uh, you're in control. You've already got history mapped out. You, you know what's going on in the future, and uh, nothing catches you by surprise. Father, we're not in control, and we don't know what the future holds for us immediately, and, uh, and sometimes we get anxious and, and frustrated. And, but Lord, I pray that as we meet, that you'd come and you'd encourage us, you'd strengthen us, you'd help us stay the course with you, and that... Um, You'd give us wisdom to know how to navigate life and how to navigate the relationships we have to deal with each day. So, Father, would you bless this time? Would you bless the kids in Kids Bridge, kids in Nursery, our Tots Bridge Ministry? Lord, we also want to pray for our partner ministries down in Honduras, um, the two uh, church projects in Manos Extendidas. Lord, um, these three uh, ministries down there that we're partnering with, they need your support. They need your provision. They need your strength. They need your encouragement as well. And I just pray that today would be a very positive, impacting day for them. Would you meet with them as, as you meet with us? And may this be a time well spent. So, Father, thank you for what you're doing. Thanks for being here with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're starting a three-week series today uh, called Ready, Set, Go. And the idea here is simply... Do you think there should be more to your life than what you are presently experiencing? Do you think that your life should be more impacting and more influential than what it is? Do you sometimes just feel like you're struggling to survive, let alone thrive and, and get ahead and, and actually create change in this world? And do you just sometimes feel overweighted and burdened and like it's hard to move forward? What we want to do today is we want to sim simply say, God is more for you. If you've not yet crossed that line of faith and embraced a relationship where you say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life entirely. Do whatever you want with it. Just go crazy with it. If you haven't yet done that, you're, you're sort of questioning, why would I choose to do that? Why would I choose to give my life over to God and just do, let him do with it whatever he wants? Am I really willing to do that? Am I trading up or am I trading down if I give God my life? And so some of you are really questioning, if I give God my life, what is he going to do with it? And, and what's he got in store for it? And we want to talk a bit about that over the next three weeks. If you give your life to God, what does he have in store for it? And, and we just want to tell you, uh, he's got incredible things in store for you. He has exciting things in store for you. And even some of you who have come to the point where you say, God, I've given you my life, you're saying, okay, well, this is it. This is... And you're finding that you're hitting a wall, you're not moving forward, and life is just, again, an existing thing and not the adventure that, that Christ tells you that he invites you to. So we want to figure that out too. But what I want to do is I, I want to start today just by giving us the big picture of what God's plan is and what his purpose is. And, and, and so I, I've got my little markers here. I've, I've got my little easel. Because when God created us, it was with, with, with an exciting plan. If we come way back here to the beginning, let's call this creation, where God designed us. God says that he wants us to be part of his creation, but not just a part of his creation. He wants us to be the rulers over his creation. Look what it says in Genesis. Those of you who have been coming to LifeBridge should almost have this passage memorized. In Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And the whole idea here, when God created you, says, I'm, I'm creating this wonderful masterpiece of creation. But I'm not going to physically rule on it. I'm going to have you physically rule on it. 
You will subdue creation. You'll keep it under order. You'll keep it sustained. You'll keep it going. You'll make it a beautiful work of art. This little garden of Eden that I created for you, that's an example of what you're to do to all of creation. And the whole idea here is that you will rule. Isn't that kind of cool? You were created to be a ruler in this world. How's that going for you? Do you feel like a ruler? Do you feel like someone in charge? Do you feel like someone on top of things? Do you feel like you're subduing creation? Do you feel like you're bringing um, peace out of chaos? So that's what God created you to be. But I also want you to know that's not just what you were created to be in the past. If we jump ahead to the very end of the picture, according to God's timeline, in the book of Revelation, and the very end of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, and it talks about our future. Listen to what it says in Revelation, two passages. Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll. Talking about Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on earth. That's, he's talking to those of you who have crossed that line of faith. Those of you who chose to embrace a relationship with Jesus Christ as your king. He's making you into a kingdom, into a people, of a priesthood. A, rule, a nation of rulers, and you will reign on the earth. This is in the future. Listen to what it says in Revelation 22, verse 5. There will be no more night. This is on the new earth. God's going to create a new earth. He's going to say this old earth is going to pass away. The heavens and the earth he's going to destroy. He's going to create a new earth, a new universe. And he says in this new earth, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord, your, the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So in eternity, eternity over here, again, the whole idea is rule. <laughs> Let's try this again. Behave. It's not listening to my rule. We'll deal with it later. <laughs> so if at creation we're created to rule and our eternal future is the rule, why are we struggling with rule now? And, and, and we know that from Scripture, something happened shortly after creation here that we call the fall. It was at this fall, something incredibly significant happened. That's why it's called a fall. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, you and me, we decided, I don't want to represent God's rule anymore. I want to represent my own rule. You see, the type of rule that we are supposed to play here and we're going to play there is not our own independent rule. It's our rule on behalf of God, the creator of the universe, the king of the universe. He is the ultimate ruler, and on the earth I represent his rule. That's what it means I'm his image. I'm the physical picture of God in heaven on this earth. You are the image of God. You Believe it or not, whether you act like it or not, you are a visible picture to everyone else of God in heaven and his rule on this earth. But the problem is when we decide it, saying, I'm not going to represent God's rule. I'm not going to do what he tells me to. I'm not going to rule on his behalf. I'm going to do what I want to do. And, and in so doing, we sinned against God. We embraced evil in our lives. And as a result, we've been doing sinful stuff ever since. That we suddenly broke relationship with God. And even though we still have the responsibility to rule, suddenly my capacity to rule suddenly dropped because the, the way I was supposed to rule here and the way I will rule there was with the Spirit of God in me and empowering me so that I could rule in this world in tremendous ways. Adam and Eve had incredible capacity to rule. But as soon as they sinned against God, the Spirit of God had to leave them because he's a holy God, and a holy God cannot unite with, a sin, with sin at all. And so the Spirit of God got separated from us. And now I'm here, and I'm supposed to rule, but I don't have the power of God, his presence in my life, ruling through me. And now rule becomes a struggle. It becomes an incredible struggle. 
Listen to what the curse was in Genesis chapter 3. To the woman he said, because you've broken relationship with me and you've ruled your own way apart from me and, and my spirit has had to leave you, here's, here's what you're going to experience. I will greatly increase pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Instead now of experiencing joy and peace in relationship, which women are geared for, women are going to experience pain and sorrow in their relationships, even with their own husband. And instead of co-ruling with their husbands, the sinful tendency of the husband will be to rule over his wife, not with his wife. And it becomes an oppressive relationship. Or it can sometimes be the other way, too. But either way, there's, there's no more joy. Relationship becomes a struggle, becomes a challenge. Listen to what it says to Adam. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. You will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. So for Adam now, the, the consequence of breaking relationship with God, the Spirit of God being removed from his life, is the rule that he was supposed to exercise here in subduing the earth, he can't even keep the weeds down, he can't keep the thorns down. Even living is going to be an issue of survival, not of joy. See, what's happened to rule here? He's still got to rule, he's still got to take control over creation, but it's going to be a challenge, it's going to be a struggle, and there's no guarantees now. Where before he couldn't die, now he could die. Now one of these animals that he was supposed to rule over could attack him and kill him. Now, things that he could uh, have to deal with, like poison ivy and mosquito bites and all those sorts of things, now will affect him instead of him controlling them. See, our rule becomes distorted. And life now becomes a challenge. It becomes a struggle. And you're going to encounter that this week, aren't you? You're going to go to work. Is work going to be just thorough joy, of which you are in complete control? What about the people you're going to work with? What about your family? Are you feeling in control in a good way in that? Or is there stress? Is there anxiety? Are there fears? Are, what, what's going on? Because here, there was never to be any fear. Only confidence and boldness. In eternity, God wants to restore us to that. But in the process, we're here. How do we get from here back to here? Now, it's not, I'm saying back to the future. Because really what we're doing is we're recreating what it was supposed to have been back here. God's saying, I want to get you back to the garden. I want to get you back to being what I created you to be in the first place. And this is the adventure God has for you. If you're willing to walk with him, God has you on the adventure of trying to get you from here back to what he created you to be, but for an eternity in the future. So how do you do that? How do you get there? How do you learn to live in this world in the way that God intended you to live, not just as a matter of survival? Why don't you ponder those thoughts and see what brilliant ideas you come up with as we go through the rest of the service. Uh, survival and comfort are two of the words that I think can typically describe my life. All right? uh, one is just getting through the week, but then, you know, just living in a life that's peaceful and comfortable. I, I can spend a lot of time on those two words, survival and comfort, right? They can define my life. You know, getting through the week, getting what I want, peace and quiet, no busyness, empty. But that's the challenge for us because each one of us, that's probably are the two words that can typically describe our lives too. What is the point of your life? What are you striving for? Is it survival? Or is it survival and comfort? Or is it just comfort? What is the driving force behind what you do? Why do you go to the job that you go to? Why are you involved in the things you're involved in? What's defining the direction and the shape of your life? You see, as God's image... We are actually created for so much more. You were created for significance and for significant impact in this world. 
not just a getting through, not just a survival. You were created for significant impact on God's behalf. God has a plan. God has purposes that he wants to carry out. And the way he carries it out is through his image. And God's got big plans. But what happens for us is we've broken that relationship with God. We've fallen so far from where we were created to be that so many things all become confused and distorted and, and we don't know which direction we're headed. We're not sure what we're supposed to be doing. We don't even understand the authority we're supposed to have. And life becomes a little bit of a frustrating challenge for us. So what God does is he, he says, oh, I, I want to fix this situation. But the problem is um, that fall, that declaring independence from God, that demands the death penalty. Uh, when the spirit of God left our lives, he's the God of life, the spirit of life. When the spirit of life left our lives, all we're left with is death. And that's all we can expect. Judgment and death eternally. And God says, oh, I don't want that for you. It's what you deserve, but I don't want that for you, for any of you. So what I'll do is I will actually come down to earth and I will die in your place. And so Jesus comes down to earth. But he didn't just come down solely to die in our place. He also wanted to help us understand what it means to be what God created us to be. So when Jesus comes down to the cross, I'm going to try this again. If it disobeys and crashes, we'll live with that. So at one point in time, Jesus comes down into earth. And the idea of coming down in the earth, like I said, will be ultimately to die on the cross, to pay the price for our rebellion over here. But there's something else he wants to do in the process, and that's give us a picture of the rule that we were supposed to be living. Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. When it talks about Jesus, it says, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the he is is the visible representation of who God is in heaven on earth. And what he's going to say is, by me taking on that image in the form of a man, I'm showing you what you were supposed to have been and what I'm bringing you to. He's giving us a picture. And, and so when you think about the things that Jesus did, what did Jesus do? He preached the kingdom of God. What's he doing? He's representing God's truth in the world. God's message in the world, what God wants to communicate to this world. So Jesus goes around teaching, but he didn't just do that. He also healed. What's he doing? He's subduing nature. He's subduing the effects of the curse. Every illness we have came into place starting here. There was no illness here. When we broke relationship with God, when we moved away from God's design and God's plan, that's when all the illness and everything started creeping into the picture. So Jesus, he starts subduing creation. He does it by healing people. He does it by calming storms. He does it by walking on water. He does it by turning water into wine. He's controlling nature. He's subduing nature. What's another thing he does? He casts out demons. You see, one of the reasons we fell was Satan came along. Satan was an angel kicked out of heaven with one third of all the other angels that chose to rebel against God. So these fallen angels cast down to earth. They're not in hell, they're on earth. We call them demons, we call them evil spirits, but they're angels kicked out of heaven. And in the process, they convince, they tempt Adam and Eve to sin. Adam and Eve agree with them in their rebellion against God. They eat the fruit. And now, along with Satan's whole army, Satan's now rebelling against God in this world. And most of us as a world are following suit. But what Jesus does is he starts pushing back Satan's authority. He starts pushing back Satan's rule and says, no, no. The image of God is here to rule on God's behalf. And so wherever Jesus goes, he pushes back Satan in people's lives. Satan's authority. He conquers Satan. He defeats Satan. You know, so then Jesus tells us that that's what was intended. That's where he wants to take us. So the way he does that to start with is he pulls a group of 12 men around him. 12 men from all different walks of life, different characters, different skill sets, different personalities, and people that weren't even considered religious. 
people that were sometimes considered outcasts and the sinners of society, Jesus pulls 12 of these people together, 12 of these men, with the idea that he's going to take them from the fallen state and return them back to rule. He's going to restore them back to what God intended them to be in the first place. And you know what he calls that process? Of taking us from where we're at and bringing us back to the position where we will once again rule? He calls that discipleship. You see, discipleship in our churches has not been very clearly understood. Sometimes we think that, oh, being a disciple just means you're a follower, you're a student of a teacher. That's not what discipleship is. It's a part of discipleship. But what discipleship is, is the idea that you will become a student, you will become a follower, but with the idea that you're going to be trained and equipped then to have authority and rule in that area that you're being trained in. And so... If I'm being discipled as a philosopher, I might go and team up with Plato or Socrates in those days, and I might follow them around, and I might learn from their wisdom with the idea that someday I would then stand in their place and continue that teaching onto others. I would become the teacher. I would become, in a sense, the ruler of that discipline the master of that discipline. If I was going to become a doctor, I would follow someone around. I'd learn from him. I'd, he would teach me everything he knows. He'd get me trying things, experimenting with things, working with people, with the idea that then eventually I would become a doctor all on my own, apart from that other doctor. And then I would go and I would help other people learn to become doctors too. If I was to become a teacher, I would follow a teacher around. If I want to become a spiritual leader, I'd follow a spiritual leader around. See, discipleship, though, was never just being a student, where I keep getting more information and more information and more information. But that's sometimes how we approach it in church, isn't it? I just want to get more information. I just want you to keep teaching me and teaching me and teaching me. But I want you to know that that is not God's plan. God's plan is just not to teach and teach and teach and teach and teach. God's plan is to make you back into the ruler you were intended to be. Now, some of you are going to have an insecurity built into your life that says, I can never be a leader. I can never be a ruler. And I just want you to know, first of all, number one, that is a lie that you have bought into. It's a lie that comes purely from Satan that says, don't represent God, represent yourself. Oh, you blew it, represent yourself. Well, I guess you can't lead anything. So we don't. We feel inadequate. We feel insecure. But you know what? You were created to be a leader. You were created to be a ruler. Now, we lead in different ways. See, that's part of the problem. As soon as you hear the word leadership, you think one specific model of leadership. No, no, we all rule. We all lead. We all have impact and influence in this world in different ways because God has created us uh, uniquely different. But you see, as soon as I say, I'm not going to be a ruler, you've bought into a lie. And then secondly, you need to understand it's incredibly irresponsible. God has given us a job. He's given us a job to be a ruler in this world, to have impact in this world, to have influence in this world, to, to represent his rule in this world. And the moment that I say, I cannot be a ruler, I cannot be a person of influence, I cannot be a person of impact, you are abdicating the God-given responsibility you were created and equipped to carry. And so our challenge is not just saying, how can I learn more? How can I learn about God? How can I learn more of me? How can I learn about the Bible? Our challenge is actually, how do I get back to being what God intended me to be in the first place? Where I can go with boldness and confidence in this world, representing his rule, representing what he wants to do, and do that with, with a sense of um, conscience and peace and confidence and boldness and joy. Because I also got to let you know, if you're camping out here in your fallen position, and saying, that's where I'm stuck, that's where I have to stay. When you buy into that lie, when you're devalued in your significance, and that's what it does to you, by the way, too. And if you hear struggle with low self-esteem, it's simply because you don't understand what you were created to be as the image of God. See, that's part of Satan's deception. You are not to represent God. You are not his image. You are not a ruler on his behalf. Well, if you're not that, what are you? You're nothing. You're nothing. 
And so most of us go through our lives with the struggle that I'm nothing. I'm not significant. I'm not important. I can't do anything of significance for God or for anyone else in this world. I, my best options is just to survive. And if I one up on survival, it'll be to survive with a certain degree of comfort and peace. But I got to let you know, that's still a self-rule. That's still a breaking apart from God's kingdom. It's a breaking apart from your intended design. And it's going to be empty. It's going to lack joy. It's going to lack fun. It's going to lack adventure. And you're going to be trapped in a low self-esteem. You're always going to be questioning your value. You're always going to be questioning your worth. You're always going to be questioning whether you're lovable. You're always going to be questioning, could, could people ever see anything good in me? You're, you're going to struggle with that constantly to the day that you die. But Jesus came to restore you back to image. To, and to take you from being where you feel trapped right now and to move you forward. The disciples, each of the 12 disciples, understood this. Each disciple, when they agreed to hang out with Jesus, understood this. They just had a distorted picture of what this really was. Let me explain. When they chose to hang around with Jesus, it was because they believed that he was the promised Messiah that the Old Testament was saying would come. The king that would come, that would establish rule in Israel, that would defeat the nations around them, and specifically the Roman Empire at that point in time, would establish Israel as this great and mighty, enduring kingdom that would last forever on earth. They believe that Jesus is the promised king to come because they, they, they hear the testimony of John the Baptist, they hear what Jesus is saying, they see what he's doing, and they realize, this is him. This really is the king that's going to come. And so when Jesus says, would you follow me and become my disciples? They're thinking, yeah, because what's Jesus going to do? He's going to establish himself as a king. And, and then what's the king going to do? He's going to appoint his bodies as rulers. His disciples understood that they would gain positions of authority in his kingdom when he established his kingdom. So when they're following Jesus, they have a certain mindset of where that's going to take them. <laughs> but, you know, the longer they hung around with Jesus, their understanding of what the end picture started to change. And for some, they start getting a little bit disillusioned. Judas got a little bit disillusioned because he realized, hey, wait a second. Instead of us building power and wealth and, and all this sort of stuff that we expected, every single dime we get, we're giving away to the poor. What's with that? Well, at least if I'm holding the money bag, I can redeem some of that money. And so Judas did. He'd reach into the money bag, and he'd just put a little bit over in this pocket here. So when they gave money to the poor, he still got at least something out of it. He was one of the poor that was going to get something. And then eventually he realized, you know, I'm following this Jesus guy. And, and you know what? On this very night that I've set me to him, what's he, what's he telling us to do is become foot washers? The lowliest of servants? That's the nature of his kingdom? I want nothing to do with the nature of that kingdom. That's not the type of kingdom I want to build. And so Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Because Judas realized what he understood, the rule that God was leading him towards, that Jesus was going to disciple him towards, wasn't the type of rule that he was expecting. But each disciple, when they started, understood that they were being trained to be a ruler in Jesus' kingdom. So when Jesus starts this process, he realizes, gee, for me to take these guys from this position to, to being able to entrust them to move into this world with impact, I've got th a three-year window to do that. Jesus understood this three years to take these guys from being skeptics to people I can entrust the entire kingdom into their hands and say, go, I'm leaving you now. They go, what? He says, don't worry, you're ready. And by the way, my spirit will come and will indwell you and will help you and equip you. So don't worry, I've trained you for three years. I knew what I was doing. That's what he's telling his disciples. And now the time is I'm going up to my father in heaven. I will come back someday, but between now and the day when I return and fully establish my kingdom, between now and then, rule. Represent God's rule in this world. Wherever you go, represent God and do the things I've taught you to do. Change lives. 
Build the kingdom of God. Go out with confidence and boldness. Do not walk around in insecurity and ashamed and low self-worth. That has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. It has nothing to do with what Jesus was recreating us to be. So three years to retrain them from their present mindset of how they're to live in this world. And this, this is quite something. We have established an approach to how we live in this world, and we think it's right. That's why we're doing the approach that we're doing. We think it's the best approach for us. Jesus is going to come along saying, yeah, it's all wrong. Let's try it this way. Let's start realigning your life with my values and my principles, and, and, and it's going to take Jesus three years to get them to start shifting the way that they think about life and what they're here to do. Three years to build into their lives. Three years to, to change their faulty thinking, because their thinking has become incredibly faulty, just like you and me. Our thinking has become so distorted since the fall that when God even tells us to do something, sometimes we go, yeah, right. Or when God speaks a word of message about you of value, yeah, right. I love you, yeah, right. I have got significant purposes and plans for you, yeah, right. And we question God every step of the way because our thinking has become so distorted, so faulty, that when God tells us something that's truth, we say, I don't think that's true. No, I don't, I don't think if I actually do that, that'll give me greater joy and peace. No, I, God, you're wrong on this. Oh, God, why you let this happen? That's wrong. If I was God, I never would have let that happen because I know better and you obviously don't. See, our thinking has become so distorted that it's going to take Jesus three years to start changing his disciples' faulty thinking. It's going to take them three years to start training a right behavior instead of our reflexive sinful behavior. See, I got sin behavior down pat. I can do that without thinking. Jesus has to come and rewire my thinking. He has to start training me, saying, Rob, instead of doing that, I want you to do this over here. What? Okay. But as I start doing something, I default to this. It's taking three years for Jesus to start training right behavior into his disciples. See, this wasn't about just giving them content. It wasn't about putting them on a course to teach them the uh, values of the kingdom or methodology of the kingdom. He was changing lives here, restoring them back to what they were intended to be. That, that's really the goal. Um, we've got these sorts of things still here. I, I, I want one of these. I think they're, they're cool. But, you know, I don't want one for the right reasons. <laughs> you see, the right reasons mean there's something that's happened to my body. There's something that's happened to my body that I can't even support myself. And so the whole goal of physiotherapy, for those of you who've been in car accidents, I won't mention Norman Shelley, um, but, you know, for those of you that have been in any type of car accident or any type of injury, and you go to physiotherapy, what is the whole goal of physiotherapy? It's to get you back to what your created design was supposed to be in the first place. And so they're going to go through various processes. First of all, they're going to start teaching you about what's going on with your muscles and why you need to do different things and why you need to do this first and then that next. They're going to start teaching you some stuff. But then they're going to give you some tools to help you. And then they're going to start giving you some exercises that you need to go home and, and develop disciplines. And you're like, don't you hate that? Go home and do these exercises. Oh, I hate those exercises. I'm sure I'll get better if I don't do all the exercises. <laughs> I don't need all those disciplines. I'm sure I'll get better just by default. That doesn't work too well, does it? But then eventually you, you graduate and you don't need that. Now you can get around these because you're getting a little bit better. Your body's getting a little bit more healed. It's getting back to its original design a little bit more. And then eventually you can get rid of one crutch and now you're just on, on and eventually you can get away without any crutches, and then you just stay there, and, and maybe a cane. But the process, the process is to get you from the distorted picture physically to the healed picture of what God intended you to be in the first place. That's what physiotherapy is about. And it doesn't happen overnight, does it? It's a process that we need to go through to get back to what we are created to be. And, and so essentially, Jesus is saying, I want to get you from where you're at in this fallen state where your thinking's all messed up, your view of God's messed up, your approach in this world's all messed up, and just bringing you emptiness and sorrow and grief. You're just feeling you're struggling to survive, not thrive. And he says, I want to get you from there, and I want to get you to here. Who wants that? Do any of you want that? 
or do you want to camp out here? Now, the ironic thing is, we think, oh, yeah, I at least know this. I at least know what I got here. So I think I'll just camp out here. It's like the guy in the video. I don't want to go beyond kindergarten. I know what I'm doing in kindergarten. It might not be great, but at least I know what I have there. I'm in control there. And God's saying, that is not what I have in store for you. Don't get trapped here. Don't stay here. Keep driving to this point. So then Jesus then, because this is his intent, listen to what he tells his disciples. And again, another passage you, most of you have memorized. In Matthew 28, he says, Therefore, as you go, or as you're going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's what Jesus says is the mission of the church. The mission of the church is not just to teach and is not just to equip. The mission of the church is to teach and equip and to encourage and give experiences and, and, and responsibilities so that you get to this point over here. I would like to think that after you being in church 20 years from now, you will not be at the same level of spiritual maturity and responsibility in your life that you are right now. And yet, isn't that often the case where you go through church and you spend a whole year in church and at the end of it you're saying, have I progressed at all? Gee, I've went to lots of Bible studies. I've heard lots of teaching. I sang lots of songs. But have I actually grown in spiritual maturity and responsibility? Am I closer and more effective in ruling or am I just more knowledgeable? And I, I have to say to you that if, if at the end of you being here for 10 years, you just feel more knowledgeable, but you haven't moved any further in your assuming responsibility to rule in this world, then we have failed as a church. Or maybe we've provided stuff as a church, but you've just chosen not to move forward. You said, I want to camp out in kindergarten. Jesus wants people who will represent him and his message boldly and effectively in this world. And so, life is the training ground. This process of discipleship in this world is the training ground for here. You see, Jesus is saying, you are going to rule here. Uh, if you don't want to be a ruler, if you don't want to reign in this kingdom, in the, on this earth, if you don't want to spend eternity doing that, just walk away from God right now. Just walk away from Jesus. Walk away from discipleship. Walk away from any of it. Because that's what God's got in store for you. You will be a ruler throughout all eternity for all of in his kingdom. And what he wants to do in this time between now and the rest of your life is he wants to build you to be what he's got planned for you there. This is the training ground for you. And it's got significance and impact because the more effectively you rule in this world now, the more other people will hear about Jesus Christ and choose to respond to him and turn to him so they can be restored too. There's important stuff at stake here. People's lives are at stake. Jesus is not interested in creating a community of 12 disciples who at the end of the three years would say, hey, you know what? Let's just stay as a little group, the little 12 of us. Let's just hold our weekly Bible studies and sing our weekly songs and let's just keep encouraging each other and let's just stay here. Jesus would have been appalled at that type of thinking. The idea of just growing a, even a larger family that just stays here and comforts and encourages each other, as valuable as that is, if that's the end result, Jesus would have been appalled. That was not his great commission. He didn't say, go into the world and build a really nice, comfortable church. He said, go into all the nations, teaching everyone you come across about who I am. Represent me to them. Represent my message to them. Represent my character to them, my love to them. Let them know I exist and what I have in store for them so that they can make a decision as to whether they want to enter my kingdom too. He says, that's what I'm building here. That's why he chose the word discipleship. I'm creating disciples because a disciple is someone who follows and leads to the, or follows and learns to a point where they can then take the message and run with it themselves with confidence and with boldness and can make a difference in this world. This is Jesus' plan. This is what he wants to accomplish. So, 
at LifeBridge here then, as we're thinking about what is our mission as a church, uh, really part of our goal is to bring people to that point of spiritual maturity so that they start assuming responsibility for the growth of others. That's really what we're trying to accomplish. And, and so we've taken our, present, our old mission statement and we've changed it. And uh, we sort of simplified it down to these four words. And if you want to write these four words on your sermon insert, you can do that. The first word, is what we're wanting to do is, if we're going to do this disciple thing of, of, of reaching out to people, the first thing we want to do is connect. We want to connect people to God through Jesus Christ. So wherever I go in the world... I want to be thinking, how am I connecting that person over there to, to, to God? How am I introducing them to Jesus Christ? How am I doing that? How am I connecting people as I go to my work? What is my strategy for connecting people in my workplace to Jesus Christ? As I go back to my family, what's my strategy for connecting people to Jesus Christ? What is my strategy? That is the first starting point of making disciples. I'm just going to connect with people and introduce them to Jesus Christ. So connect is step number one. Well, number two then, the next step, as we talk about here at LifeBridge, is, is relationship. Hopefully, as some of you come to this connection service, the Holy Spirit's going to start working in your life, saying, okay, you've been connected to the community, but now God wants a relationship with you. He's not interested in religion. He's not interested in you doing all the religious stuff. He wants a relationship with you where, where he can enjoy you, you can enjoy him. But it's not just a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's a relationship with him and his family. And that's why we don't believe that you can just go off by yourself and worship God all alone. People say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. N no, well, technically, but if you're going to embrace a relationship with Christ, you're embracing a relationship with his family. It's like, I'm marrying my wife, I'm marrying her family. <laughs> There's no getting around that. <laughs> when you marry someone, you get the whole kit and caboodle, right? If you marry someone with children, you're getting their children. You're getting their parents. You're, you're getting everything. When God invites you to a relationship with him as father, he calls you his children. But then also in scripture, we're called brothers and sisters in Christ. You're being invited to a community. But more than a community, you're being invited to a family. Well, that's great. But that's not where it stops either. God's not just creating a family and saying, okay, good family. Let's... He wants everyone to be part of his family. He wants everyone to know him, everyone to enjoy him. He says God desires that none should perish, that none should pay the consequence for their sin. He wants to forgive everyone, but he needs everyone to understand and repent and turn back to him. And so then our role as a family and as individuals is then to go and represent God in this world. I'm to represent his truth, his message. I'm to represent his character. His love, his mercy, his patience, his good, like, all the fruits of the Spirit. I'm supposed to represent that. Wherever you go, in your workplace or in your family, people should have a much clearer understanding of who God is because you're there. Does that make sense? If you're his image, as people look at you, they think, oh, as I look at you, I understand the nature and character and purposes of God much more clearly. Thank you. Thank you for being here and modeling that for me. Are people saying that to you lately? But that's the reality of what God's calling us to. As you look at my life, and we try and be transparent with our lives. We try and let people into our lives. We, we let people stay with us at times. We let, we do, uh, sometimes I'll share things that Julie and I decide to do, decisions we make. Because the idea is here, as you look at my life, as distorted and sinful as I am, I'm at least hoping you're getting a little bit of a picture of the character and the message of who God is. Because that's what we're all supposed to do. Now, I'm going to mess up on that. I'm going to distort that picture for you. But fortunately, we're a community. And as we all pull together, hopefully we can start representing a true picture of who God is in this world. But then it just doesn't stop with represent. It just doesn't mean that I go to my workplace and I model a picture of God. It doesn't mean that I model my picture of God at work and then I come back to my church family and I just sit here and I sing some songs and get some more feeding, more feeding. That's not the end result either. The end result is that as you are strengthened over time, that you will be bold and confident yourselves to assume spiritual responsibility for the spiritual growth of others. That the end result of you being at LifeBridge over a period of time is that hopefully you have come to the point where you're willing to say, if a ruler I am to be, 
then ruling I should start doing. I should start assuming responsibility for the spiritual growth of others. Because that's ultimately what God's calling me to be, is his representative loving people and caring for people and representing his, his purposes. And so what did the disciples do? As soon as Jesus left them, they started assuming responsibility for the spiritual growth of others. That means they went into different towns. They left their homes. They went into foreign countries. They went to around the world. They went to India. They went to Spain. They went up into the north. They, they traveled all over, bringing the message of Jesus Christ wherever they went because they understood my, my goal here is not to stay home and to be comfortable. My goal is to assume spiritual growth for the development of others. So we, at LifeBridge, we have this, uh, the one C and the three R's. I was just joking with Dave saying, saying, hey, we could call you the connectors. <laughs> Get it? Connect R's? Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Same, reaction. Same reaction from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. Uh, we could see our cubed. I don't know how if you want to remember it, but um, whatever the place. As a pastor, I've been in churches where I've led Bible study year after year after year after year, and at the end of those years, I look back saying, "Where have we moved? Are, are people much stronger and bolder in representing Christ in this world?" And a lot of times, I said, "No." And I've heard stories from you where you've gone to church for 40 years, 30, 40 years, 20 years, but you're not doing that either. You're, you're serving maybe in capacity. So are you assuming responsibility to help others grow? After, after 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, Jesus, after three years, brought his disciples to a point where they assumed responsibility for the spiritual growth of others around them. And what we're saying at LifeBridge is, I think it would be really cool if after 10 years here, if after 10 years we had people saying, it's time to leave LifeBridge because God's calling us out there. We're going to go to another nation to tell those people about Christ. We're going to go plant a church over in that community because there's no church in that community and that, church needs, that community needs a representation of Christ there. Or I'm, I'm going to stay here, but while I'm here, I, I want to be reaching out to my coworkers and to neighbors. Or I, I want to be playing an intrinsic role here to help us accomplish the mission here. Whatever the case, I would hope that anyone who's been at LifeBridge for any period of time will have a built-in understanding that they are here to grow the kingdom of God, to assume responsibility for others, to actually start acting like the ruler God created you to be in this world. Not a distorted picture, the world's definition of ruler, but Jesus' picture of ruler, which is, you know what rulers do in the kingdom? They wash feet. They clean toilets. They give the shirt off their back. They walk with people two miles instead of one to help them out. They, they sacrifice themselves to build others up to be what they need to be. They give their lives to do it. All the apostles gave their lives in assuming responsibility for the spiritual growth of others. And Jesus says, anyone who would follow me, you need to pick up your cross and follow me too. It's that serious. The end result is so important. He says, now, who wants to join me? And at that point in time, when Jesus said, who wants to join me, in that, those terms, in that sense, many disciples walked away. They weren't willing to trade the kingdoms they were building for themselves here and their comfort and their survival techniques. They weren't willing to trade that for the kingdom that Jesus was inviting them to. Judas chose not to embrace Jesus' picture of a future. He chose to create his own picture of a future. I gotta let you know, it didn't go too well for Judas. Um, it'll not go well for anyone who chooses their own kingdom over God's. But I do wanna say to this to you, at LifeBridge, I envision a church that takes this process of moving people to a point of becoming a ruler in this world with boldness and confidence. Now, you have different ways of doing that. God's designed you with different personalities, different giftings, different strengths. We all have different ways to have influence and impact in this world. We'll talk more about that in an upcoming series on serving. But, but, but that's where God wants to take you. If you want to go where God wants to take you, then we've developed our process here called growth groups. It's a five-year process. 
It's not perfect. It's not right. It's not the best thing. But it's at least the model we've chosen to try and say, there's certain things we need to teach you because we're supposed to teach you everything Jesus commanded. It's also a community of support, encouragement, and accountability. It's also a group where we're going to encourage you to go off and do certain exercises as far as reaching out to your neighbors and friends and, and caring for others and assuming responsibility. There's things we're going to call you to do because that's part of our process of training you so that you can be the type of ruler that Jesus told us to make. That's our mission. Is that compelling? Is that a mission you'd like to be a part of? If so, join with us. Why don't we pray? <sighs> Father, I'm terrified. <laughs> uh, this whole idea of uh, stepping out in boldness and confidence and representing you in this world, um, that's a little daunting, and I don't always know how to do that. But Father, you say that if we at least embrace that journey with you, you'll equip us, you'll give us the words to say, you'll empower us the same way that you did Jesus on earth through your Holy Spirit, that same Spirit of Christ will indwell us and will equip us to do the same types of things Jesus did. And I just want to thank you that you've got so much in store for us. I want to thank you that you've elevated our significance and role in your eyes. I want to thank you that you love us and you respect us and you want to journey with us. Thank you that you invite us to this future that you've already prepared. Lord, would you give us the courage to say yes to it? Because that's where joy awaits us. Do that work in our hearts. Change us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing this closing song.